Are you searching for a safe haven away from all the knee-jerk negativity around Tottenham right now? You've found the right place to be. That doesn't mean we're going to be toxically positive. That's apparently a thing now. There will be some fair constructive criticism. But if you're looking for a place where we're not all nose out of joint, extremely upset, rage reactions, you've found it. So, and with me to talk about it all in detail is Johnny over in Dublin. How are you, Johnny? All right. I mean, obviously, <laughs> three points would have been nice, but uh, I, yeah, I, yeah. You said it well. Beautiful intro. Uh, we 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 just have to dust ourselves down and, and like be try and be balanced and look at the look at the big picture. So yeah, I'm, I've I've been worse. Things things aren't too bad. We're still here. Balanced is what we'll be. And yeah. to be balanced with us today is Stu over in Dubai. How are you, Stu? Good. I'm I'm the same. My uh, my knees are not jerking. I'm um I'm fairly happy and. Obviously not happy with the result, but um, happy with the style of play and direction we appear to be going in. Good. So we'll start with that, shall we? I think there's things about the performance we'll talk about today because there's arguments and we had some fun disagreements around, was it Dragosin or Romero? Was it Dragosin failing with an offside trap or was it Romero ball watching? That was the main culprit for a goal or we both. conceded. Or both. Or both. Very true. Um, why aren't we taking what looks like very good chances. Why aren't we accumulating high levels of XG despite playing really good football in many aspects of the game? And they're all questions we'll cover off. But just wanted to kind of start a bit more with where you both feel we are at the moment as as a kind of club and a project. I think that's kind of where the fans are starting to splinter off. Some are saying, that's it. It's been a year. We should be up here but we're not there yet. And others are saying, give him a 10-year contract. What are you talking about? Let's take our time here. Your expectations are way out of whack. Where, where are your expectations, Johnny? <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, I just think that, that like so many things in life, we're talking about margins. I'm, I'm not... Um, saying that everything's great and things can be better and some of the some of the points you refer to there that we'll get into a little bit more detail are, are not genuine issues but i think there are certain things that we're definitely improving with um i think going back obviously the, the transfer window is now closed and we're looking at the squad we've talked about that quite a bit over the last few weeks talking about the ins and outs and i mean it's just a process i'm sorry i i, I know we all sort of gather around the TV on an away game and, you know, your Sunday kind of lives and dies on the basis of the outcome of a game, right? I mean, I don't want to live like that, though. Like, I, I, I'm obviously more invested in this football team than is maybe healthy. And I know that in the sort of spectrum of, like, um, devotion or, or, or fanaticism, I'm pretty moderate compared to a lot of people. So it does really piss me off when we don't win. But like, let's look at the things that are are actually improving, and let's look at where we were, and let's look at where we want to go, and let's remember we're in a an incredibly challenging league where every team wants the same success. Every team is spending well. The vast majority of teams are spending money. We can't keep up with a certain level above us. So there's all, there's so many sort of um, contingencies and variables, and, and maybe this sounds like waffle and guff, but at the end of the day, I just think. Um, it's a football match, a game we should have do well, we dominated, a, a game which we should have won. We probably should have nine points if we. I think, I think that's fair enough. Um, if you looked at the the fixtures, you think, okay, we'd like to think we'd have a decent chance of getting nine points or maybe seven points, but we've got four points, so that that's disappointing. But let's look at let's look at the reasons why we didn't win. Like you just said, um, we dominated, but we don't really create clear-cut opportunities. There was a couple of... Like, uh, Pope had to make a couple of very good saves, but there were a couple of opportunities with, which maybe could have been taken a bit better. And obviously, we're missing our our big money signing sent forward. Son isn't playing in the position he should be playing in. There's so many things. So you asked me about where we are in the process rather than specifically about this match. So where we are in the process, we're still in a gradient that is going in the correct direction. It's not always going to go 
uh, the, the steepness of the gradient is not always going to be linear. It's going to be steeper and then it's going to flatten off. And like, I don't know where we are at the moment, but we're going in the right direction. There's lots of things to feel positive about. I could waffle on forever, obviously, because I'm good at that. But, you know, I think it, I'm happy with where we're going. I, I, last thing I'll say before I let Stu actually speak, but the, the what I, I'm getting more and more annoyed with other fans, which I don't want to be because it shouldn't really bother me at the end of the day, they're going to have their opinions. But I just, it, people talking about the manager, people like me tossing off these um, comments about how, how we, you know, we're, we're basically it's a completely easy to play against. Now, I'm not saying it, there, there are very obvious vulnerabilities. It's a very high risk strategy, but it's like, let's also look at the things that we now experience every time we watch Spurs and let's remember what it was like for the previous mm -hmm. number of years. I don't know which I prefer to have. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Well, maybe that wasn't a very clear answer, but I'm, I'm, I think it's just a journey, isn't it? Like we're going in the right direction. Maybe you should have just said that. <laughs> no, I think some of the points you made there were really well, well put. And it's like, Thanks. I am, you are happy with the overall direction. And you mentioned you, what you essentially saying there is like progress. Isn't just like a linear upward straight line. Yeah. I was, yeah. I use like any progress in life as like more like a how you imagine a stock price to go. Yeah, exactly. It, it trends upwards, but it bounces up and down as it yeah. goes. Yeah. And you look at it over anyone who's into buying stocks and shares, maybe not essentially the, the, the Buffett, the greatest stockbroker ever, Warren Buffett. He's always said like, you've got to hold on to your stocks. He tells stocks for at least five years. Because it's like I'm invested in this and there will be knee jerk moments, be it a change in the economy, be it the change of a CEO, be it a change of something, be it bad luck, be it whatever. But if you believe in the leadership and thing that this company offers over time, success comes and you need to wait for the av law of averages. But Stu, what about you? Kind of same kind of question at the moment where you are with it all. Yeah, I, I think... Um, you know, kind of referring back to my, my intro statement about knee jerking. Um, I think people need to be calm. Everyone we referred to as with transfers earlier, everyone wants to be by bright highlight and pinpoint the youngsters before they become hundred million players until we buy youngsters and then everyone goes furious and we need to buy marquee signings. Um, before even judging how these players play. I mean, <laughs> that's the most ridiculous thing. And, and then looking at, look at where you bought them. We bought them from, from Burnley, from Championship Leeds. And like, well, Odeberg technically was a championship player, but he, last season he was in the Premier League. But secondly, where did Liverpool buy Henderson? Um, uh, what's the name of that, their left back, the, the Scottish left back? Um, Robertson. Robertson. They, they, they bought a whole bunch of players from the likes of lower teams like we did. So people, be calm. Um, and then it's also like, you know, we've got to trust the manager. We've got to stop chopping and changing. We've got to believe in a process. Look at what Arteta did. The Arsenal board were smart. They stayed with him. They gave him time. And look at them now. They're the, the closest challenges to City. Here we are, one season and three games in. And people are already like, ah, oh, he's been found out. He's yeah. got no idea. And like, guys, can you not see the difference between how we finished last season and we were not playing well? And the way we're playing now. Yes, the results are not there yet. But if you can't see the direction is clearly on the uptick, you're not watching the game. You're just looking at the result at the end of the 90 minutes and saying, we're well, shit, we lost. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at this, I've got the stats here. So shots on target this season were ranked second. Possession ranked first. Touches in opposition box, first. The problem is big chances created were eighth and expected goals were seventh. So again, not, not shit, <laughs> just more mid table, but it just shows mm -hmm. you that we're getting there. We're just lacking far be it for me to, to say, but the number nine that we bought for 65 million quid to be fit, to be in that six yard box yeah. to finish off those chances that we're creating. Because again, I'm, I'm on, a, on a rant here, so I'll, I'll shut up soon. But the, the thing that also XG, that everyone goes on, ah, XG shit. Yeah, but XG doesn't really count the crosses that no one actually connects with, because mm -hmm. XG connect counts the actual shots. But Only we're shots, putting, yeah. yeah. So we're putting in and creating the opportunities if the players make those runs. So it's not a real reflection. Just looking at XG, you've got to scratch a little bit deeper and do further analysis than just look at results. We're shit. 
that is the missing thing about XG. And as an example, if you didn't know this and you're listening, like you can, if a player puts a through ball to one of your players and for whatever reason they don't want to score because they're trolling the opposition, they could be, it's standing in front of an open goal, stop with their hands on the hip with no one within 50 meters of them and all they have to do is tap it in. If they don't kick it forward to technically put it as a shot, it doesn't count as any XG, even though that was like 99th percentile chance to score that you've, you've created out of that. So it is really, really misleading and in out of context, but it's a very useful tool when used cr- correctly, a very useful stat. Um, we need to be careful as well, guys, I'm finding, because if the majority of us are very much still on board with the project and we're very much backing of Ange and where that we think he needs, that you said it before the show, Stuart, Johnny, I can't remember what you said, it took four years for um, you know Klopp's system to truly work for him to win a trophy. Um, Arteta with two eighth place finishes. We're in that second season where those guys were coming fifth and eighth, right? Like we're we're still very early and Ange has had one... You, you, I wouldn't even say it's a failure, but one moment of his career, he doesn't deem as a huge success. And that was when he was managing the Socceroos. And Vaz, who listens to the show, was meeting, actually went to a meetup for, um, to meet Vince Rigari, who's just released a book all about Ange Postacoglu. Um, and he asked him some questions for us. And the one time Ange just almost kind of failed, if we call it that, in his career was when he was hounded out by the fans and the media. And they just didn't believe in him. They didn't trust him. And they kept with the same criticism and Ange doesn't after a while it wore him down to the point where he just snapped and they look back and they regret that as a country in a way that they they hounded him out when actually oh my gosh he's gone on to prove he is the real deal and we should have stuck with him that bit longer and some of our fans are risking doing that like when you look at that speech when he won the treble of Celtic it's thank you for believing in me you trusted me. I was thinking, when, when he stands out in front of White Hart Lane, when we win the league with Ange, he's not going to be saying, you believed in me and you trusted me. He's going to be saying, I fucking told you so. <laughs> you should have believed in me. And we could have even more. I just wish we would just have that little bit more patience of like, can't we just have a laugh and enjoy the football? Like, we're playing attacking, great football. You're not going to win every week. That's inevitable. But the fact we're making better signings, the fact we're getting better every week, the fact the results will come, but we're not going to win a trophy right now this season, probably. Just enjoy it. Find something to enjoy in the season. It doesn't have to be the Premier League title to have fun. You can still enjoy it if your club is moving in the right direction. We're not moving backwards. We're moving forward and we've got a really good manager. So be happy. That's a bit of a... Okay, we've all ranted now, haven't we? (laughs) Should we talk about the game? But the, the thing, the thing is, we, like, obviously, we're ranting frustration at this narrative that we disagree with, and we're pretty much all on the same page with where with where we're at, and and sort of taking sort of a big picture and then comparing it with small, you know, in, individual games here and there or individual performance within games. But you know, you, a, a football match has got two teams in it, and if you're a Newcastle fan and you're looking at what happened yesterday, you're gonna like obviously be delighted that you've got the three points, but you've also got to like recognize that we were bloody lucky. And I mean, we kind of like by virtue of two moments when the opposition sort of switched over, got caught out, we, we took those opportunities and that's essentially the story of the match really. I mean, it doesn't mean that there weren't, um, there weren't things that we would, could have done better in attack, but like the amount of, uh, I mean, Johnson is the, the player who stands out for us yesterday, I, I don't think anyone's going to really argue with that. I think even the fact that we're mentioning his name, given some of the flack that he takes on an ongoing basis, it needs to be recognised and needs to be remembered for like when maybe a performance comes along in the not too distant future, people are going on about how rubbish he is. But the fact also that he came on at half time is another sort of um, counter to people saying, "No, oh, Ange doesn't make." substitutions like doesn't change things and stuff and i mean i know that there are definitely times i wish Ange would make substitutions earlier definitely but like at the same time he saw something he changed it and it made it it definitely made a big difference to the second half we were absolutely all over them for almost the entire 45 minutes uh and johnson was 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 really good but we obviously suffered from the fact that we've got personnel up front who aren't used to odebert on the far side not really coming in on those runs and and obviously Sonny playing through the middle. So like there were quite a few opportunities where his, uh, his directness, his energy, his speed and, and his quality of 
of crossing was really really good um so that's that's a couple of things that are really positive about yesterday outside of the result then also like i'll mention one other thing because i don't want to like hog the whole thing but like for cario I, I i think that there are elements now we've been talking at right at the beginning of the season about um uh corners and, and free kick set pieces that's what, that's what you call them set pieces right so we're, we're baropia set pieces like that's that's no no secret but yesterday i thought we were really good at defending corners and we we were pretty composed and organized and vicario whose weakness is definitely sort of coming out and taking the ball uh having that sort of domination he's maybe not got the presence of an allison or anything but I, but he didn't make uh, any major mistakes at all. Didn't really fumble or anything like that. Looked pretty sort of much more. Um, I don't know, I suppose like committed to coming out and controlling his area, uh, I, which is another really good thing to see because he's a brilliant keeper, and I think that that's something that you know is the obvious area of his game that he needs to work on. So that's another thing that in the bigger journey is showing real clear signs of progress too. So. Yeah, the, the, there are, and there are other things that you can say as well, um, which I, I won't say because I wanted to, like, I'm sure Stu's got some interesting things to say too. But, you know, um, yeah. Over to Stu, maybe? Sorry. Just, I'll finish my, finish my uh, monologue there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, Interrupt I, me, I, please, I, next time. I think that, I, I was, the point I was going to make as well, John, is like everyone was focusing on how many goals we were conceding at set pieces. We haven't conceded a goal from a set piece yet in three games. So mm -hmm. they've clearly worked on it, and it's working. We have conceded three goals from probably our best defender being involved in all three of those goals that we conceded by yeah. you know being out of place or out of position, etc. Um, so th these are things that, I mean, you, you can't plan for, you know, things like that happen. You can't plan for Romero switching off and running past Vardy. You can't plan for him charging 40 yards out of, from, the, from the area to try and close down a ball and kind of lead his, you know, leave his um, open at the back. It happens. The, the, the only one thing I would say is that, and it kind of goes back to my, my point in the summer when we are talking about who we wanted to bring in, that I still think that Madison is a weak link and we need him to get back to the form he was in at the beginning of last season because the chances, the shots we had, we had 20 shots to nine, I think it was. Their XG per shot was 0 0.2. Our XG per shot was 0 0.06. So it's just showing that the quality of shots that we had weren't great ones. And if you think about it, we weren't really carving them open and creating really great opportunities. The ones we're doing, and again, I'm going to defend Johnson, is because there's, you know, that training clip's been out there where he's been told, don't bother looking up. You make that run, you hit it to the six-yard box. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he did. The fact that Sun didn't make that run is not Johnson's fault. Johnson executed exactly how Ange wants to play. And I don't want to criticize Sun too much for that because Sun, even though he's the best finisher in our club and possibly even the Premier League, he's not an out-and-out -out striker. So he probably isn't used to doing those runs, and he's more used to kind of the sitting back and waiting for the further cut back mm -hmm. rather than driving into the six-yard box. So again, it, it just comes back to having a fit center forward. The chances, the ball domination, possession in opposition area, it's all coming along. It's all going the right direction. And hopefully Mickey will be back next to Van der Ven, and that also will make a difference with, um, with the recovery because that second goal doesn't happen if, if Mickey's there. Yeah. I think you guys have covered most of the positives there. But yeah, I was just going to say, I thought best 45 minutes of Brennan Johnson's um, time in a Spurs shirt, probably, like in terms of the threat he created. And it was so nice to see him, we've won some system, take on his man and shred him. I was like, you finally had the confidence to do that, which isn't helped by our own fans in small sections booing him, which really makes me angry. But um, I get it. That's been a thing he needs to get better at, and he's addressed it. The set pieces, like you said, Stu, so refreshing to see Vicario throwing themselves at balls where previously he maybe took a bit more of a conservative approach to and didn't get them. Um, I thought Dragosin was was fantastic. There's arguments to say he was a contributor to that goal we conceded. For some people who say you know he didn't play the offside track correctly, if you believe that, fine. But over apart from that, great performance for a guy who hasn't had regular yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, 
we were without obviously Benteke. I thought like we got young players like Saar who had a good good game. I I I thought our bench looked so strong considering we were missing three key players. We were still bringing on players which we'd have begged for last season. Um, there, there was just loads of greats. I thought on the um, side that even to defend Sonny a bit like we. We were with our third choice, probably centre forward in that setup. Actually, I'd probably say second still, would you? But anyway, it, I still think we'd have uh, killed. It, it, that squad just as a whole just feels so much more like if we could look back, even if we go back 18 months ago, I'm looking at that squad and I'm thinking, who in the squad is worth keeping? Maybe, maybe two players. I don't know why my video is messed up there. Maybe two players um, in Romero and. Um, Mickey. Who else? Sonny. And Sonny. And the rest, like, I, I can't think if I want to keep any of them because they haven't just had another good string performance. Now I'm looking at it going, there's 10, 11 players. I hope we have still at the club in the next three or four years, but we still just need to add one or two more, more to complete this team. Like, we've finally gotten back to that point. The one thing I would say, and we can't only be positive as negative, is I think Werner's performance really. Mm-hmm showed again that making the decision to bring him back straight away before exploring the market was a mistake. Mm-hmm. Agree. And, but he doesn't he feel like a stopgap where it's like we've got a lot of young wingers coming through now in Odeberg, Yang, Moore, um, who else have we got? We've obviously got Johnson. Like all these guys Lank, are under Lank 23. Lank, yeah, all these guys are under, under 23, all of them. Maybe all under 24 yeah. is a minimum. Like, yeah. I think Werner was like, oh, well, two of those in Moore and Yang aren't quite ready to be a part of this squad. So let's bring him in. If Sonny gets injured and Richardson get injured at the same time, we're going to need someone else who can play on the left. Werner, there you go. Whereas last season, he was probably a starting left winger for much of it. Mm. He's now third, fourth choice, which just show the squad has improved and, and grown again. Um, so yeah, it's. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna put, give two couple more positives actually on, on on yesterday. Even though like I don't want to come across like I'm some kind of naive like you know I, I've been borrowing some of Basuma's um, laughing gas or whatever. <laughs> um, I also think that it, it's like really nice to see us mixing up our own set pieces. Like the corners were quite inventive, and I mean. You see short corners and you think, what's the point in that? Because it just goes back to the dude who took the corner and then he whips it in anyway. You know, that's quite often happens. But that's not what we were doing yesterday. Whether it was something that specifically they identified in the way that Newcastle defend corners or whether it's something that like we're going to see more of. It's just though it, it actually led to some really good opportunities with the way they were knocking the ball around at, at the corners. And I really enjoyed seeing that. And the other thing was the other thing I was going to say. Um, yeah, just the fact that remember, like last year, like so much of the time we were talking about our players just passing all the time and never shooting. Like I know that some of the shots were like at best hopeful. You know, there was definitely some some wasting of possession, right? But I mean, we know what Paro can do with the shot. We've we've seen him like uh, hit the jackpot with those a few times, and and he I think took more shots than anybody. Else. Certainly, quite well into the game. I remember the commentator saying that he'd taken the most shots. Um, and and he's got a proper weapon there. Yeah. It, it was good to see. I know Madison's um, one that Pope saved spectacularly. It looked more incredible when you saw it the first time. Then it was actually wasn't as close to the corner as you thought. But um, you know, it was good to see at least protesting the keeper because there have been quite a few times in the last season. I think, especially when you're playing against a keeper that looks a bit sus and they're not really being tested. So. Mm. You know, those are two other things that need to, I think, be, be recognised as well. Um, we lost the game, right? So, I mean, clearly there's a couple of things that we, we definitely have to work on. But um, the, yeah, And like you say, there there are some negatives we've got to be, like, open about, and that is that there is a drawback to investing in loads of young, high-potential players that they're going to make the cock-ups while they're with you, and that's why they're not worth 150 million quid now because other clubs who can wait to pay that later will just wait and pay it when you've gotten all that hard work developing them out the way. Um, And we do have a lot of young players in this squad who are outstanding prospects, but are not quite the finished article yet. And that that is just the methodology we've taken to prioritise the transfer window. But the stats show that the average signing in the Premier League is now age 23, where it was 26 only five years ago. So 
everyone is moving to that model because of the way FFP is going. You need to have, and PSR, you need to have players with a resale value to keep balancing the books. If you keep, you, so, and we're not a club that has the, you know, opportunity to offset 200 million quid extra a year that Man City have. So we're at a disadvantage to a club like that. So we can't compete quite in the same way. So we have to be a little bit more creative. Um, if we're going for the same player in Liverpool. They're probably going to choose Liverpool eight times out of 10. So we've got to go get those players maybe a year earlier than those clubs would. And there is a negative to our wingbacks being on the halfway line um, at all times or even further up the pitch. We get hit on this counter and we've seen goals like that happen too often. Um, but they're happening less often than they were. So there's a counter to that as well. And I think there was there's that good coach on Twitter or whatever, and he was saying Hi, essentially what Spurs are lacking now is they, they're just one or two better players away from everything clicking into place and working now. But, the system, but it has taken a leap forward again this year. And that's my rant. <laughs> um, did you guys have anything else to add on the game? In particular, you want to add before we finish off on that one and kind of look forward to what's next? I, th- I thought we could do five minutes just chatting about our f- kind of expectations of the North London derby because. <laughs> go on, sorry, Stu. No, I was going to say before we go on that, not really about the game, but um, Langer did his did uh, the in house interview oh, good point. with regards to the transfer market. It, it kind of fit in with what you were saying, John, Jim, that you know they were targeting players for the future, but ones we're also able to play now. Um, and I think that's what pleased me is we had a, a very clear strategy. It's not like in the past, you didn't, we were just kind of hit and miss, just playing whoever kind of fit was reasonable, could do a job. And now you can clearly see there's a strategy, there's thought process, we're doing our due diligence because um, both Lange and, uh, and Ange both said that Solanke and Odebert were players that they targeted from the beginning they weren't last minute even though we didn't know about it until one minute before it was announced you know in Odebert's case they were targeting for a long time same thing with Gray so again it wasn't last minute we were reacting to other people no it was something we were working on you can see the strategy you can see where we're going um, and, and it fills me with confidence I think you know what we're doing we just need to be patient you know Let, let's give these players a chance let's get behind them let's not ruin their confidence because they have one bad game um, and who knows, a year from now, two years from now, these guys are going to start hitting their peak and we could be laughing. Yeah. Yeah. You'll we've only, got, go on, only got Reggie left from the, the players that we really wanted to shift. Um, and we're not hearing, not that I really look at social media um, much at all, but we're not hearing about Uncle Dan uh, getting, in, in, you know, getting involved and interfering and scuppering. Uh, offloading players and, and the like of that. So, yeah, that that whole shift the, in, in the way that the the um, recruitment and 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 personnel was <laughs> was structured, restructured last kind of Easter time last year is clearly like legitimately seems to be doing what they intended. Um, and he, like you said, has been properly. And I think, you know, it reiterates the fact that they're obviously for the future looking at their age. You know, they've got mm. you know, nine years of them before they hit the peak. Um, is the fact that these are all players who've played reasonable mm-hmm. minutes already. So it clearly they aren't token players like, you know, club signings for the future. These are clearly players that Ann just signed off on. And he's happy to throw in from the start of games, you know, bringing on with 20 minutes left. You know, he clearly believes in them. Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it's nice to see that the club appears to be on the same page with a long term plan, which is what I think many of us have been asking for for years, that, you know, Daniel runs the business. We've got people on the football side that run the football side and we want the director of football to be on the same page as the coach. And we seem to have ticked all the boxes at the moment. Now we just need things to start clicking on, on, the, on, on the pitch. And hopefully, once we get a, a fit striker, you know, we'll be starting to finish it off. And it doesn't matter if we concede a goal, but we'll actually start scoring two or three. So we'll win the games anyway. Um, and I, I just think one last point on that is it does seem typical old Spurs, which is something we need to fix, that 
all our players getting injured all the time. Having Solanke, Richarlison, and Lancashire all out injured at the same time was crazy. And Jim is back. Yeah, missed, missed the end of what you said there, Stu, sorry. No, I was just saying that it, it was t- typical Spurs that Solanke, Richarlison, and Lancashire, three strikers of the club. So not just where we have one and one backup. We had yeah. three strikers, and they're all out injured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, does, that's so, that's definitely a concern, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm, I I know that last year there was various points when you look at the sort of how many players are are unavailable, and you look at the other other teams in the league and where we're at, and we were definitely like kind of Newcastle, Man U. They were kind of really bad spells, and we were kind of been in up there as well. So, and you tend just kind of obviously because we're focused on on Tottenham. It you it it does seem that there is a bit of an issue there, doesn't it? I mean, like the fact. It can't all be just bad luck. You do wonder what, what is what is story, the, the story there. I know that we're talking about, say, Ange's um, training or uh, methods or whatever is, is putting a, a greater stress or burden on certain aspects. But like a, a medical team must be able to work with whatever the strategy is, one would assume, to... I mean, the fact that Solanke has is, is missed two out of three games is crazy, isn't it? Like when you consider last year. It's just that that is so... Um, the the word I don't like to use, the S word with the Y at the end. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, so, but uh, but uh, that that is a concern for sure. I mean, the the other thing that when you're talking about the points you made, um, Stu, when you're looking at various aspects and from, kind of from coming from where La- what Langa was saying. I mean, I just think that uh, it's if you're listening to us and you've not not, not watched this podcast or listened to this podcast before and if you're really skeptical about things you might like just dismiss this as a like a just like three delusional men who like you know don't really know what they're talking about and they're overly forgiving of uh <laughs> or we're like some kind of like levy worshippers or something like that and like if you watched the podcast from the beginning last year like we were really like mo- pretty much every Tottenham fan uh, in that sort of la- final few months of Conte, like we were pretty much pretty depressed every week. We were having the same conversations every week. We weren't, we weren't very happy with what the ownership were doing. We weren't like just like throwing all the toys out of the pram and saying that there was nothing that he'd ever done that was good for the club. But like, I think we've kind of just, we can sort of see what the ambition is what the direction is and exactly what you've said there Stu like there's a there's a very clear kind of notion about how we how we want to play obviously the selection of managers integral to that but the structures that are in place the sort of recruitment we've got and it's all like everything is really consistent and we are seeing progress on the pitch too but we're just going to have really annoying games like yesterday and hopefully there'll be far fewer of them so there's there is I, I don't know like I just I don't want Tottenham to ruin my life um, every time they lose, because like, you know, mm. there are other things in life. We have got other things that that we're very great grateful for. I know this is a Tottenham podcast. I don't want to be giving sort of some kind of you know holistic, uh, feel good, well being kind of pep talk to people. But do you know what I mean? Like, this is something that is really important to all of us. But like, would people just get a grip? You know, we we're all obsessed with Spurs. We've all got full time jobs, and yet I'm sat yeah. in a room. With five Tottenham shirts, <laughs> and with a Tottenham scarf, and in my free time, I pay thousands of pounds for a season ticket to travel yeah. down on my weekends when I've got a family to fit in around yeah. this, and that's time lost to them to go watch yeah. eleven boys play football. Um, <laughs> it's ruined the next my next my happiness over the next two weeks is uh, at least fifty percent lower than it no. would be if we had won, like at least as a minimum. I've I think about it. Pretty yeah. much, I don't go an hour of the day without thinking of like well, a bit annoyed about a loss or whatever it is. Yeah. Johnny, you fly from Dublin every week and look behind you, you've got about 40 pictures of, uh, of Spurs. Stu comes yeah. come over from Dubai to watch games like once or twice a year and he goes to supporter meetups in the country. And then we're all we all sit around on a podcast in the evening talking about it instead of having a beer or like going to the gym or something. We like literally uh, sacrifice damn. our mental and physical health because we love this club. And then yeah. I'm wearing a top sun t-shirt as well, for goodness sake. And then someone has the audacity to will say, happy clappers. It's like, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. this, <laughs> this ruins my life a lot when we're not doing well. Uh, if I, if I had the ability to, to 
Spurs are run with Levy a bit like, if we don't go to the I'm going to stop that conversation. But we are a bit like a football club where we've set things up to be very safe. It's like, don't worry, we won't slip back down to mid-table mediocrity for a sustained period. And we will remain within a conversation of the big clubs at the top. But we're like the safe boyfriend or girlfriend at home, where it's like, um, they always like got a good eye on the finances. We don't go splash on silly holidays. It's always a four star all inclusive yeah. Turkey. And at some point you're like, can we just fucking go to Barbados and spend the money and just go business <laughs> yeah. class, screw the kids savings, screw the house deposit. Let's just do something. Well, I want a Porsche on the driveway. Now I've had enough of my Skoda. Let's just be silly, but we don't do that. Yeah. And people are just, yeah. I think some people are just desperate for us to do that once and see us get a Martinez to get a, you know, stupid superstar that will probably not work out, but just be the club that do a Chelsea and we won't. And I think it really winds people up um, and they get, and they exude that anger in the wrong, in, in the ways that aren't productive and they are to like lose faith in a project like this. Um, I, I, I think from, from many, obviously not, not Johnny and not many of, of our viewership from Australia, but a lot, of Spurs fans are also England fans, and I think the frustration is is we are basically the replica, the, the England of clubs, mm. because you know mm. we haven't won anything since the, the title since the sixties. You know, yeah. we flatter to deceive, we get so close and then fail at the final hurdle. So I think it's just a frustration that whatever team we want to win just doesn't. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if it's off season or during the season. It's just frustration after yeah. frustration building year after year. And you're like, just once, please, God, make me happy. Yeah. I don't know what it's like. Yeah, I... it's a lot easier being an Ireland supporter because you know it'll never happen. So you just, if we can beat England at the weekend, then that's, that's it. We're happy for <laughs> a couple of years at least. Still thinking about Stuttgart and Ray Houghton and all the rest of it. Like, I mean, it's the, those... the level we've made is you've always got something to lose and so little to gain. And it's because you're like, yeah. and England have it as a national team as well. It's like, we play Ireland, like you say. It's a huge game for the Irish or the Scottish when they play England because it's that whole kind of like UK rivalry, UK and Ireland rivalry. And, you know, we've got a bigger population and more money. So it's bigger satisfaction to beat you, beat us. Like, I get it. And for history as well, we won't go into yeah. all that. Just history. a little bit of that. <laughs> a little bit of that. Um, won't talk about that one. Uh, but, uh, like, but if we beat Ireland, it's like, well, you're supposed to. Yeah. That's just, that's your job, as Roy Keane would say. Like, you yeah, can't yeah, yeah. really enjoy it to the same level. So the only time you can really, you're allowed to enjoy celebrating is when you beat Spain on the big mm-hmm. stage or something. Like that. And we don't really do that. It's very rare. Mm-hmm. We, we do. So you're just always angry. And the media love to shoot you down like they do Tottenham and build you up and shoot mm-hmm. you down. So yeah. you just, when's it my turn? When is it my turn to be Spain? When is it my turn to be Man City? When is it my turn to even be Chelsea? Like, I want to be the one with the trophies and the silly toys. We're always nearly there, never quite there. So I get what people are annoyed, but it will come. And when it does, and it's only going to come if we stop whinging like babies and get behind a manager like Ange and give him three to five Fine. years. It might not work, but I, I think it's more likely it will than it won't if we do stick with him and we give him the backing. Jim, I don't know what you think about like because when you said earlier about you know imagining um, Andrew's speech from the pitch if when we win the league, right? And it wouldn't be the same as the Celtic because of the like um, skepticism around him and what and what he's doing, how how good he is, etc. But like when you when I'm in the stadium, I don't really get a sense at the moment, and I know these things can change quite quickly. But but my interaction. People and the people who are around me, I don't, I've not really kind of detected any kind of like very clear skepticism right. or, or, or discontent with the manager. And you know, I mean, we, it wasn't like, okay, last year was such a crazy start. We were all singing his name continuously, right? That was the kind of sort of emblem of the first couple of months. But like you hear, even against Newcastle, every time you watch Tottenham on TV, the away games, the fans are singing his name. And True. and it still happens in the stadium too. So I don't know where the you know, the fans that are on social media, probably a lot of them, and obviously some of them do go against, but I don't. A lot of them don't. They're you know, it, it might be a slightly different sort of representation of the fan base, and 
maybe the ones with the loud, kind of squeaky, irritating voices are not really that representative of the kind yeah. of more, you know, yeah. mainstream. And to be fair, our Way fans have been consistently yeah. outstanding. Made brilliant. Yeah. And they have endured the biggest losses from our losses, if that makes sense. And they're always the last ones to turn on the manager, you find. Like, even mm. when Con- I remember we were going under the Conte era, a lot of us, me included, we were still singing Antonio Conte's name pretty yeah. much up until he had his meltdown and slagged the club yeah. off. Yeah. And the away fans were backing him and the players at all, in all those games as well, traveling away. So it's, it's always that there is a minority of ones who grumble about it at the stadium to me now. It's a very small minority. Okay. But why is it always a bloke who pronounces Kulisevsky, Kulachevsky fella? It's always like, and that Kulachevsky speller, he ain't quick yeah. enough. It's always someone who can't say Kulisevsky, but they are the first to turn on, um, turn on the Pazicino, manager. Do you remember a lot of people said yeah, Pazicino, well, they're so. still calling it that. And they, <laughs> and I, I, loads of people do it, but they still call the Premier League the Premiership. Sorry. That's right. It's always yeah. Premiership, Kulachevsky, <laughs> that Puchettino, Puch- 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 and it's just Puch- like. Puchettino. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why it's always people who can't pronounce those things right. But, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Um, anyway, boys, I better wrap up there. We're, we're, it's been a good good chat. Um, I think we'll regroup in a week and do a bit of an Arsenal... Um, Arsenal... And a, and a recap of the transfer window. Yeah. Recap yeah. of the transfer window. Yeah, well, I think we'll do rate the signings. Season yeah. predictions. Yeah. Sounds good, sounds good. All that stuff. Cool. Right. Up the Spurs. Like, like and subscribe, Spurs. people. Yeah. <laughs> and hey to Vaz again, and thanks, Vaz, for your um, your questions you sent in. Um, yeah, good chatting with you, mate. And yeah, roll on the next, roll on the North London Derby in two weeks. Come on, Ireland. Go on, you Spurs. <laughs> Go on, you Spurs. Go on, you Spurs. <laughs> Go on, you Spurs. <laughs>